Okay, well, uh, we really are looking at faster and faster processes. I believe the, the next generation of Intel is rumored to get up to 300 watts. Uh, GPUs are certainly there already today. Um, and fast abundance interconnect is really, actually interconnect is the stuff that's really holding HPC back today. And really, to make it happen properly, you really need very, very dense uh, systems so you get short connections, low, low error rates, and being able to go faster. And then finally, that leads you into the three, two to three kilowatt baseboard requirement. And what's going to happen is, is that the more cooling you provide, the more, uh, the more CPUs will get crammed into that same space. And this is really what's possible today. This just shows one of the, the things that um, we've sketched out and we've actually tested in the lab, um, thermally tested in the lab, I should say. Uh, this, is, uh, and, uh, this is actually a, a, a mock-up of uh, what we're doing. And this is definitely feasible. So you see it's uh, 8 Zen 5 5100s in a two blade. That's about 1.2 kilowatts. I'm sorry, that's, uh, that's per side. That's two kilowatts. And the latest one, they've, they've actually increased some more. So that's going to be, uh, I think it's one, uh, 270 watts per uh, GPU. So why don't we use air? I will say this really is self-evident. You know, you look at the duct size on, on air, it's, it's enormous. And with refrigerant, we can, for each, uh, each uh, ounce of refrigerant, we can do 3.1 3 million times more than you can with air. I mean, so there's just no, no excuse for using air anymore, really, in a, obviously in HPC. Now, presumably you've all had courses in physics, right? I went to one, uh, I went to one lecture um, and I asked all these facilities guys, okay, hands up, who's out of facility class? Nobody put their hands up. So, no, you know, so I, as, I assume that everybody sort of understands properties of matter and so on, so we can look at how these liquids actually work and how they're used. So this is basically the system that you see just about everywhere. They have um, water, um, enterprise water, or water from the, from the building, goes through a heat exchanger, because otherwise you're going to get fouling. And then you have, you pass it through the heat exchanger, and then you pump it through a couple of quick connects onto a couple of blocks on top of your CPUs or whatever. Generally, these things need fan assist, which is really, really, as far as part of the point of, of, uh, of going to uh, liquid cooling. It's best to do the whole thing if you're going to do it. Uh, so these are a couple of examples. And really, if you've seen the IBM thing, I think you've probably all been to SC. And a couple, uh, I think last year or the year before, uh, IBM showed some of their stuff, their Aquasar. And really, that, that piping is a thing of beauty. It really is. I mean, it costs the earth. Um, and, but, and then you've still got connectors. So, uh, and those connectors, if you think about it, let's say you've got a, a, a 500 cluster system. So that's 1,000 connectors. And each year it's about 8,000 hours. So over three years utilization, that's 24,000 hours times 1,000. So that's uh, 24 million hours of operational time for those connectors. Now then, somebody did a statistic class here, probably realize that they're probably going to have a few failures, and you're going to get water all over the place. So, and then the other thing, of course, these things are um, not that simple to, um, to service. You're going to, you're going to need to train the, your service techs to Look out for water. Be careful when you when you push the servers in to make sure there's proper engagement with the the connectors and so on. So about oil now, then I think you're all aware of the the only one that's really using oil in this way is Green Revolution, and it is not a bad solution. Um, it's definitely the oil is low cost, 
Um, good specific heat. Somewhere near water. It's insulated, non-toxic. I mean, they say what what could then it's no, got no global warming potential. However, on the negative side, you're going to have to use lots of pump energy because it's quite viscous. And one of the surprising things when I look this stuff up is that it does tend to exidize after a while. So you're going to have to replace it every so often. Uh, you know, and then um, of course it's it is an oil. And in most cases, I was talking to a data center owner today, and he said, well, yeah, I put it in my facility. And I asked him, you know, would your insurance company uh, allow you to put it in the facility? And the answer came back, probably not. So it's not isothermal. So you're going to have thermal, thermal gradients over, uh, over the equipment that you're passing the, the oil. Um, it doesn't conduct very well, so you may actually end up also with um, barrier layers, and again, uh, hence the hence the the turbulent flow. And this is what it looks like. Uh, you've got the bath. Um, the oil is pumped through a heat exchanger and then comes out through little jets under the servers themselves to push the to counteract the lack of, of uh, convection. And it's, again, it is an elegant concept. But um, I don't know if you've uh, you've always heard about the, com the 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 competitions for catching the greased pig. So can you imagine a server covered in grease that you've now got to carry from the bath to your uh, to your workshop? Now this is a this is a a, a useful one. No, Novak actually is pretty neat because. Because of its moderate boiling point, you can actually use it either in a single or a two-phase system. And it is now, if you're using it in two certain phases, it's going to be isothermal. That means because when you boil, the temperature doesn't change, so it's just going to stay constant over the whole surface that you're trying to cool. non concessions really low viscosity, very nice. And um, coefficient, it really conduct, convects very well. I spoke to the guys from Isotope. They said, yeah, it's great. You know, we, we can see that, that convection because it's got a great co coefficient of expansion and it, it really bubbles away and, uh, and moves the heat. And it is non-flammable. However, I'm told that uh, it's $400 a gallon. Um, and, it, uh, and you may need, uh, if you're just going for a specific heat, you're probably going to need some turbulent uh, flow. And the heat flux may be an issue. Just shut up. It's only my wife. Um, so, uh, where were we? Um, and then we may have uh, toxicity. It really hasn't been checked out very well for toxicity. And, but it has got a reasonable uh, global warming potential. So that's in its favor. Um, the, uh, the single board and fluid, there's, there's actually two ways this is done. There's one by a, a company called Liquid Cool, and the other one is, is a slightly different method, and that's isotope, and we'll talk about both of them. So in these cases, they fill in the, uh, the module with the fluid, and the, the, the motherboard sits in the, in the, in the fluid. Now, I'd, that could be an, another issue, in fact, because... Um, the, it hasn't been proven yet of, of how much uh, the Novak can actually dissolve uh, the varnishes on the board. So I don't know. It, maybe it's not a problem at all. And all. But the good thing about these systems is that all the components of the board are, are, are cooled, just like the, the Green Revolution. So you don't, have to, you don't have any of this piecewise cooling. But again, but again you've still got the quick connect. And this is the first one. This is the liquid cool. So what they do is they pass liquid cool and, uh, through a single heat exchanger. And it's very compact. It's pretty efficient. So they can probably pack these in pretty tightly. Um, issues is that you can only reach one end for putting I.O. on it. And obviously you then need to ensure that you've got uh, liquid-proof electrical connectors because the whole thing is flooded with liquid and you've got to figure out a way of getting 
I.O. from the sink. So it doesn't really fit very well in HPC if you've got to get lots and lots of I.O. And this is the way they do the module. This is the isotope. Same thing, but now they, they, uh, they actually pass the water into the module, and they have a heat exchanger built into the module wall. It's pretty elegant, actually. And this is what it looks like. This is the isotope, and as you can see, that you can see the, the um, serpentine of the, of the cooling uh, there in the, in the module. But as you can see, could you imagine trying to service one of these things? You've got probably half a dozen screws to remove. You've got to empty the fluid, uh, change out your DRAM or repair whatever's wrong, and then put the whole thing back together again. And again, you've only got this limited I.O. because you're, trying, you're battling with, uh, with the fluid. So let's go on to uh, R134A. Now then, you're probably all aware of R134A. Um, you all drive cars, presumably. So that's what's in the air conditioner. So you, you, this stuff is ubiquitous, and it's also pretty low cost. So it is, again, isothermal because it is used in a, a two-phrase system. And again, it's just like uh, it has most of the, the, the positive characteristics of, uh, of Novak. And, but with the uh, added advantage, it is widely available and it is well understood. Negatives, the low thermal conductivity probably doesn't ma matter too much uh, if you're in a, um, a two-phase situation because you're going to get boiling. And the, and the boiling creates a turbulence anyway. Then there's a possible toxicity. There are some articles out saying that, you know, some people have been affected by it, but, uh, but generally uh, most people believe that it is uh, pretty low toxicity. And I'm still here. So and I've been breathing a lot of the stuff as we developed it. And, but it does have a fairly high global warming. Uh, everybody understand what global warming's potential, how it's measured? Okay. Um, but the good news is that there is now a very, um, there's an equivalent fluid, uh, the uh, 123YF, which is GWP of 6. So as soon as it's readily available, we're moving over to that. Um, and it's very, uh, very simple. It, it totally eliminates the the, uh, the necessity of having any connectors because the, the cold plates themselves are actually soldered into the chassis. Um, and when you push the, when you push a blade into the chassis, uh, the, the, the blade itself, the, the, the cold plate goes under the lid. And then once it's fully inserted, the lid is cranked down and the uh, the cold plate itself is then uh, squashed against the components to cool them. Uh, we, of course, we have to bring all the components up to a single level uh, by the addition of heat rises, which bring all the heat up to the level of the top of the dims. Um, and it's not 2,000 kilowatts per rack. I'm, I got over ambitious. It's actually only 200. Um, but you can see in the uh, the, the top left, that's the picture of the of uh, a blade. There are two we actually use Intel E2600 JF boards in here. And uh, as you can see, the, the let's see, there should be a, oh, that wasn't very good. There you go. How do I put this back? There you go. Oops. Oh, lucky. Oh, where's the laser? Is that the laser? Oh, that's it. How did I get a green laser? Everybody else been having a red laser. Oh. <laughs> so these are the heat risers here. And as you can see, these are the dims as well. These are essentially standard dims, and we have a supplier that actually um, designs the dims with a, uh, with a jacket that is, is, um, is very flat on top, so it's easy to cool them. 
And then the only other thing that we need is on the chipset, put another little cooling block. Um, but again, what we do is go through, measure the, measure the uh, heat dissipation of the various units, and then figure out what needs to be cooled. Um, we have a system at Slack. It's been, um, it's got 128 servers in there. We've had no server failures with it in the last uh, 10 months. And um, those are the providers of the whole list. I assume that if you want to get a hold of this, this, pre this presentation will be available. And really, essentially any liquid-cooled system that's fully liquid-cooled uh, will give you um, one thing. It'll, it'll always give you the, the, a good PUE of around 1.05. You know, the, the type then on top of that will tell you really the things that, that you have to worry then is about serviceability, how much, how much of your system is not cooled, are the two, are the two other big ones and the, the achievable density. So, the, uh, in, in our case, we, we designed this, and the, the other thing about liquid cooling is you can put them anywhere, not just ours. It's because the, uh, all you need is really a uh, source of electricity and a source to dissipate your heat. You don't need all the rest of the impedimenta that goes around a standard data center. So if you have a a, you know, a dep departmental need, and, you, and the, the rent on your college data center is far too high. You can stick it in an office. It's uh, totally quiet, no fans. Um, so it makes all the sense in the world. Well, that's the end of my former presentation. Are there any questions? Uh, it is. The, the highest I've seen with air so far is 50, and that's with uh, um, active rear doors. Um, I think that's eBay, actually. Looks like I'm getting off lightly. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much.